My name is Mary May, and I work in the UNAIDS Strategic Information Department in Geneva, Switzerland. I'm going to talk to you today a little bit about the situation of HIV in children, providing you with the data that UNAIDS receives from countries every year. I'm going to focus on different levels, the global level, some regional levels, but also focus on the 21 countries in Sub-Saharan Africa that represent 80% of children living with HIV globally. I have no conflicts of interest. The big question that we're always asking ourselves every year is how are we doing against our global targets? We set out in 2016 to reduce the number of new child infections to less than 20,000 by 2020. Now we're in 2019 and we have 150,000 new child infections, well above that target. Similarly, we made a target to reach 1.4 million children with treatment by 2020. Here we are in 2019 and we're at 950,000, so also well below that target. So what's happened in 2020, now that we're in November? Well, we've had a lot of disruption to services because of COVID-19. The initial drops in pregnant women receiving treatment do appear to be temporary. I'll show you more of those data shortly. But we also are seeing declines in the number of children receiving treatment. So what does this progress look like? Let me start with vertical transmission. We were attempting to get to 95% of pregnant women receiving some treatment during the pregnancy by 2020. We've reached 85% coverage globally among pregnant women, which is a, a remarkable achievement. However, those new child infections persist. As you see in the line on this chart, the number of children becoming newly infected still remains quite flat at around 150,000. More work is needed to reduce that number. If we look at this graph, and just focusing on the left-hand bar, which is looking at the number of women uh, who are HIV positive and pregnant in those focus countries, we see that almost half of them in the dark blue part of that bar are receiving treatment before they become pregnant. And that's great, that's wonderful. That means they're less like, the least likely to transmit um, to the child. That lighter blue bar is a number of women who are receiving treatment, but that starts during their pregnancy. So they're probably identified as being HIV positive during their pregnancy, and they're started on treatment. The worrying part, is the top part of that first bar there, because that's what's leading to the infections in the second bar. So the gray area are women who dropped off of treatment. The yellow area is women who received no treatment whatsoever. And the orange, the two orange colors, are women who seroconverted either during pregnancy or during breastfeeding. As you can see in the bar on the right-hand side, that's led to the new infections among children. And you can see that most of those new infections are because of women who received no treatment whatsoever, while the orange is an important second um, uh, piece, which is women who Sarah converted either during pregnancy or breastfeeding. The top part of that bar are children who became infected during pregnancy. The lower part of that bar is children who were infected during breastfeeding. So what do we need to do about this? We need to close the remaining gaps in women accessing treatment. This is primarily important in Western and Central Africa. Secondly, we need to support women to remain in care during their pregnancy as well as during the breastfeeding period. Finally, we need to prevent new infections among pregnant and breastfeeding women by making sure that they're protected during that very vulnerable period. What have we seen from COVID? Since uh, around uh, June of this year, UNAIDS has asked countries to provide us monthly data on the situation of services in their country. So in these graphs, I'm looking at the situation of the number of women receiving treatment who, a number of pregnant women, HIV positive, who are receiving treatment. And I'm comparing the values from February, which we assume is a normal month of receiving services, to the subsequent months when we know the COVID interruption happened. I've put the month of April in orange to try to highlight that as being the peak of when the services were interrupted. From a select few countries that have relatively good data from most of their facilities, you can see that um, most of the countries had a, a small blip in services, which has then gained, um, gotten back to what the, the expected number of women rece um, receiving services would be. 
you see that by the, the darker blue from more recent months, getting back to the level of that black line, which means it's on par with February. There was a deep in, dip in services in all countries except for Mozambique and Rwanda. If we look then at what happens after the vertical transmission, we want to make sure that all of those children who are um, exposed to HIV are being tested. What we know from this year's data is that about 720,000 HIV-exposed children were tested at two months, and that's well short of the 1.3 million children that were HIV-exposed. When we look at this by country and over time, we see that there's been some significant gains in early infant diagnosis for children between 2015 and 2019. Um, but that coverage is still not high enough. We still see many countries, the majority of these countries, having less than 75% of the children being tested uh, by two months of age. What does that look like in the time of COVID? Well, we can see again from a graph where we're looking at the number of tests performed in countries, looking at February versus subsequent months, we identify that there has been um, a dip in services for five of eight countries presented here. However, most of those countries have a return to parity, as in they're, they're getting the same amount of tests conducted um, as they were doing in February. So that's a good sign. So let's talk about children who, who were infected and are now living with HIV. Globally, 53% of children living with HIV are receiving treatment, which is well below the 68% of adults on treatment. You can see in this graph that the, the number of children living with HIV is declining. Currently, it stands at 1.8 million children. The reason that it's declining is because children are aging out. So it's not necessarily a bad thing. It just means that those numbers, we've done well with PMTCT and those numbers are, are coming down. However, you can see that the number of children receiving treatment is flattening. Most recent data from 2020 for the mid-year suggests that those numbers are actually declining. So a lot more effort needs to be done. The hardest part is to find those children. Uh, we do know the ages of those children suggest that among children not on treatment, about 69%, in, at least in the focus countries, are over the age of five or five or above. That means we need to find them through ways that are different than early infant diagnosis. The most uh, potential uh, method would be that uh, in index testing among family members. That needs to be intensified in order to reach those children. If we focus in on South Africa, which has the highest burden of children living with HIV, and look at their cascade, the 90-90-90 cascade, you can see the big difference between adults, which are in blue, versus the children, which are in red. So while ad adults have or achieved 92-71-93 in terms of the 90-90-90 targets, children are far behind, not necessarily being diagnosed, with only 77% being diagnosed. Being diagnosed. Only 69% of that 77 are currently on treatment, and among that 69%, only 72 are virally suppressed. The last population that I want to talk about is adolescents, and we still don't have very good data on adolescents. 12 of the 21 focus countries provided age disaggregated data. Among that, 12 or 5 did not have data for the 15 to 19 age group. Two of them show lower coverage for people 10 to 19, for the adolescent age group, and that's Uganda and Malawi. We need to continue our efforts to disaggregate those data in order to understand the treatment gaps among the adolescents. So in conclusion, I think there's some very basic steps that we need to do to finish our, epidemic, our pediatric um, efforts. First is to really maintain an emphasis on closing the treatment gap for pregnant women. We need to provide options for women at risk of HIV to test routinely during their reproductive years. That will ensure that they're on treatment before they conceive and thus having the best chance of reducing new child infections. We also need to support women living with HIV to remain virally suppressed during pregnancy and breastfeeding. That will require us to start testing women for viral load suppression around the time of delivery, a new effort for countries to do in order to really ensure the success of PMTCT programs. Fourth, we need to reach the remaining 600,000 HIV-exposed infants who were not tested with by two months of age. If we can find those children early and start them on treatment, we're much more likely to save their lives. 
And finally, we need to intensify the family index testing to reach the remaining 850,000 children currently not on treatment. Thank you. For additional information, please go to aidsinfo.unaids.org.